I want to invite you to grab the take-home insert that you received. It's, it's titled, the, the Time is Now, a Study of the Book of Haggai. I'll invite you to turn to the inside. There's a, the text is there as, as well as a place for you to take some notes. There should be some pens in the pew racks in front of you. They may have gotten buried beneath some hymnals, but there are, at least the last time we checked, there were some pens there. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been doing this study of the book of Haggai. And there's really been two purposes. One, and, and this is the purpose every Sunday, is simply to understand what the book of Haggai is saying. It's in the Bible. It's a short little book of the Bible. It's two chapters long. It's near the end. Not many of us, I don't know, how, I won't ask for a survey, but not many of us are very familiar with the book of Haggai. So one of the very simple purposes is just to become familiar with the book of Haggai and, and uncover the, the good news and the teaching that God has for us within that book. The second purpose of the series has really been, and this is because it's connected to what Haggai says, is to talk a little bit and to talk quite frankly and honestly about stewardship and specifically about the offerings that we give to our God. And so there have been a couple of really big questions that we've been asking week to week to week. The, the first week we asked the question, what's your priority? When it comes to life, when it comes to your offerings, are you living a God-first priority life or a me-first priority life? Are you giving God-first offerings or is God second because it's me first in your offerings? And you see that in the book of Haggai because God's people 20 years before had started a building project and then it stalled out, at least in part because they needed to go home and put cedared panels on their houses. They were living in cedared houses, but God's house lay in ruins. And so God said, get back to work, get your priorities in order. It's time to build my house. The, the second big question is, and this became a personal question, what do I do when my offerings feel like they're not a big deal? What, what do I do when, when the things that we're doing as a church or the ministry that we're doing out, when we compare it to other ministries and other offerings and we feel like what we're doing is a small thing? And God says to each one of us, he looks us in the eye and says, you, each one of you, you be strong. You do the work that God has given you to do. There are no small things because God's going to take the small things that each one of us does and he's, they're not really small in his sight. And in fact, he's going to do something more with them. Today, and I, and I think this is probably the biggest question. Today, we're going to ask one of the biggest questions when it comes to stewardship. And I'm not going to give you the first fill in yet but you've got to go to the second one first. It, it, when you start, some of you, because I, I know some of you do this, you fill in the blanks before I get there just to see if you know what I'm going to say. That way you can tune out. But the first fill in the blank is not how much. It's not what. So the biggest question when we talk about our offerings is not what should I give to God. And, and, and truthfully, that's an important question for us to ask. Each one of us, and I'm encouraging you to do this, each one of us should go home and, and, take, and ask the question, what has God given me and what will I return to the Lord from what he's given me? So we talked last week about proportional giving, but that's not the question we're going to ask today. We're not going to ask the question, how much? And, and we're not going to ask the question, when? That, that's another appropriate question we should ask. We talk about first fruits giving. If you've been taking home the, the Mount Weekly, there have been some, some, some articles about first fruits giving, and this week you'll get an article about tithing. That, that's an appropriate conversation for us to have. When should I give? What does first fruits giving mean? But that's not the question we're going to ask either. And to be honest, the other question, I should have made one more fill in. We're not going to ask the question, why, either. Which, again, is a worthy question for us to pursue. We're not going to, because why should we give? Well, to support the ministry, to keep the lights on. Because Jesus loved us. God gave us his first and his best. Why should we give? Because God did do that for us. But that's not the question we're going to ask, either. The biggest question, and, and maybe I'm splitting hairs when I ask this question, but the biggest question, and this is what we're going to try to answer today, is how... Should I give offerings that please God? It's very much closely related to the why, but there is a distinction. How should I give offerings that please God? 
So again, we're looking, what we're looking at here is, is what's going on in me? How do I bring offerings that God smiles on when I lay them on the altar? How can I serve God in such a way that, that what's going on in my heart, that, what, that he says, this is great. Because what you find, and this is what we're going to get right into the book of Haggai, we're going we're to find the answer by doing some case studies. We're going to look at Haggai, and we're going to quickly do some other case studies of how, how do we give offerings that please God. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into Haggai. Dear Father in heaven, we want our lives to be an offering that pleases you. We want to give offerings that make you smile. We, we want to do things in our life that, that you're proud of and that you're thankful for. And so, God, as, as I bring your words to your people, let the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you, that in all things you might be glorified and that your Son might be lifted up in our hearts and lives as the one who makes us alive to do things and to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to jump into Haggai, but I need a volunteer. Gage, come on. I need a volunteer. He doesn't know what he's getting into. I need a volunteer. And you're not going to have to read, don't worry. Just stand right there for a second. Because this will make more, just stay right there. We're not going to pick on you, I promise. I won't. This will make sense as you hear what Haggai says. Because what Haggai does in chapter 2, we're three months into the building project. Three months. They started building the project. They're three months in. And Haggai, God sends Haggai to the people and says, I, I need you priests to make a legal decision about this. I have a question for you that I need you to answer. I'm going to read it, then Gage and I are going to act it out so you can grab, grab onto it with your head, okay? So just listen. I'm sorry, Gage, you're very nervous right now. It's okay. Okay. This is Haggai chapter 2. On the 24th day of the ninth month, we're three months into the project, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest. He's asking for their decision, their legal, spiritual decision. Ask the priest what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it, what they're touching, become consecrated? The priest answered, no. So this is what I need your help with. Pretend, Gage, you're carrying something consecrated. When, when, when God says something is consecrated to the Lord, he means that it's holy. He means that it's set apart to the Lord. It's, it's precious to God. It's clean. And so God is asking the question, if Gage is carrying that special thing in the folds of his garment, and he comes over here and he touches me, or he touches something that I'm carrying, so just touch me. Just, you can touch me. It's okay. Does the, the, Jesus, God is asking the people, does that make the wine or the fruit clean? So just by touching me, if, by coming in, does the clean thing, in coming in contact with something unclean, does that make the unclean thing clean? And the priest said, no. And I think we understand that because how many of you, when you're sick, say to somebody who's healthy, come here and give me a hug because I think that if you're clean, you can make me healthy. Exactly. You understand, like this, this just makes sense. Clean people don't say, I know you're sick, so come here. I'm going to make you healthy real. No, we stay away because the sickness passes. Okay, God asks, okay, you're not done yet. God asks another question. Then Haggai said, if a, so we'll flip, the, we'll flip it. If a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? So, so now I've touched a dead body and in God, the way that God told his people to live, if they touched dead things or unclean things, they became unclean. So now if I, the unclean person who's touched something dead, comes up and touches, I would do that too. Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. All right, you can go sit down. Thank you, Gage. I think you get the point. Right? What God is teaching his people with this legal, spiritual verdict is 
clean things don't transfer cleanness to unclean things. And, but unclean things transfer dirtiness to clean things. Now God explains why he did this. Verse 14, Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer is defiled. So this, what God is saying to his people, you, my people, are unclean, and now you're trying to do clean things in my house, and whatever you do as unclean people is defiled in my sight. And God wants his people to think about that. So he says, verse 15, Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. In other words, this was before they started building. In other words, they, they go to the granary and they, they, they're, they're supposed to be 20 there, but they're short. They're not receiving what should have been there. And the same thing, when anyone, comes, when anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. And why? Why did that happen? God says, I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. So you, you see what happened. The people went back to work. They did the right thing, but they did it. And here's the fill-in. They did it for the, and you could fill this in with a couple different words. They did it for the rote reason, R-O-T-E. They were doing it because it was the right thing to do. They were doing it because that's what they were supposed to do. They were doing it because there was an expectation. They were doing it because God shook his finger in their chest and says, you guys better do this because it's time and you're selfish and you better get your act together. But did you catch what God called them out on? You, you see it, verse 17. I struck all the work of your hands, yet you did not... Return to me. See, with their bodies, with their actions, with their offerings, they returned to the Lord. But it was not with their hearts. And that ruined everything. You can start to think about that now for ourselves. How often do we do the right thing, but for the rote, the wrong reason. We give our offer. I'm guilty of it. How often do you give an offering because that's what you do on the first Sunday or the second Sunday or the third Sunday or the fourth Sunday? How often do you write the same check that you wrote the month before without even thinking about it because that's just what you do? And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Spiritual habits and disciplines are powerful and a good thing. But how often do we do it without even thinking about it? And how often do we give to the Lord with this, with this fearful expectation like, like i got to make God happy? We, how often in your minds, and this is a question you have to answer for yourselves, how often in your own hearts and minds as you give to the Lord, do you think, and you think about the amount, do you think to yourself, I need to give this amount of money because that amount will make God smile? as if the offering itself will bring God's smile on you, that the offering itself will make God pleased with you. Right? This is the, the right thing. Giving offerings is the right thing, but it's for the wrong reason. And you know, you, you see this in the story of Cain and Abel. I gave you references. I'm not going to read all these, but go home and look at it. There, there's, there, there's these two boys brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain was, Cain was a shepherd, and so he brought to God some of the, the flocks from his herd. His brother Abel was a farmer, so he, got, he brought God, this is what Genesis says, he brought God some of the first and the best from his, from his crops. 
God smiled on Abel, but did not smile on Cain. And the book of Hebrews says it's because of the heart, because Cain did it with a heart of unbelief, and Abel did it with a heart of faith. And so what I'm, the answer, the first answer to the question, and this is the truth that I want to help you see, is the condition of our hearts. Not the reason why we do such things, but the condition of our hearts makes our offerings either good or bad. So if my heart is clean, and my heart is pure, and my heart is holy, then what I do will be good and pure and holy. But if my heart is wicked and sinful and unbelieving, even if it's just partially that way, then what I do is unclean, holy, and wicked. I, call, you, you, I would compare it to the cheese touch. How many of you have seen The Diary of the Wimpy Kid? The kids know. All right, I did this for the kids. In the, in the Diary of the Wimpy Kid, there's a piece of cheese that's on the asphalt, and it, it just lays there, and it gets really, really stinky over time. And this one boy, one day, touches it. And what they talk about, in the, you have to watch the movie, or read the books. He, he touches the cheese, and what that gives to him is these cosmic cooties, so that whatever he touches, whoever he touches, catches the cosmic cooties. It's the cheese touch. And I'm giving that as an example to you to say, what's going on in our hearts when, if they are unclean, they make everything that we do unclean. A sinful heart only produces sinful things, even if it looks good. Jesus talks about that when he talks about fruit out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, and, and the frustrating thing about this for, for you and for me is, is this, that there is no amount of work I can do to clean up my heart. You know, I can go home and I can sweep out my kitchen. I can go home and I can vacuum and get, as, get all the dirt out. But I, I cannot go into my heart. I cannot sit down with a counselor. I cannot sit down and meditate on God's word enough. I cannot confess enough sins so that my heart will be finally clean. It's so frustrating to try to make this heart of mine, which is sinful from birth, clean because I and you, we cannot do it. Try as you might. Try. Try. Try it one day. I'm, I'm going to do this with a clean heart and watch where your thoughts go. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. There was a woman who was really sick. For 12 years, she was bleeding and it just wouldn't stop. And she this is, this is the next case study. She tried everything to get well. She saw doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. She spent all her money on doctors, but she only got worse. And I can only imagine how frustrated she was that she tried all the things that she knew how to do to, to get well, and she didn't get well. But she heard about this guy named Jesus. She heard about his power, how he had cast out demons. She heard about his compassion, how he, how, he, how he cared for the sick and the suffering and the widow and the hungry. He heard about his care, his compassion, his power. And she heard that, that he was coming to town. And she knew it was going to be hard to get to him because Jesus was always surrounded by a crowd of people. But, but she pushed her way through the crowd. And without Jesus even noticing, she just touched the corner of his robe. The unclean woman, that's what blood made her. She was bleeding. The unclean woman touched the clean, holy Jesus. And you know what happened? Immediately, she was well. Jesus knew it. Immediately, he noticed power went out from him, and he stopped and he paused. 
And he told her to go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. He told her, you're, you're clean. You see, see the, the touch of Jesus makes clean and holy. And there was another time, a, another town, another woman. She, she wasn't sick with a sickness like bleeding, but she had lived a sin-sick full life. And everybody in the new town knew it. She was a woman of ill repute. Everybody knew that she was a sinful woman. And, and Jesus was at a guy named Simon's house for dinner. And this woman, this sinful woman, this unclean woman came to Jesus' feet and she wept and she washed his feet with her hair and with perfume. And Simon said, Jesus, how can you let this dirty woman touch you? And Jesus talked to him about, talked to Simon and this woman's right there about how she had been forgiven much and how therefore she loved much. See, what had happened is Jesus' forgiveness, his touch, had not just cleaned the woman, but the very acts that she did for Jesus so that Jesus said, I love what you're doing for me right now. And, and this is just the way of Jesus, isn't it? Ten lepers stood across the street and said, Lord Jesus, they didn't dare get close to Jesus because they were dirty, unclean people. And they called out across the street, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest without even touching them with just his word. He, he sent them on their way and they were clean and they went on their way rejoicing. And Jesus went into a, a dead girl's bedroom as her parents stood by her side weeping. And Jesus, the clean, holy Jesus, touched the dead girl. And he took her hand and he raised her to life. And a mother was walking out of town with her, her son on a coffin, bearing her only son. Her husband had died too. And Jesus stopped the funeral procession and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the young man sat up. This is the way of Jesus to make dead things, dead people alive, to make unclean things and unclean people holy. The better truth is the touch of Jesus makes both us and our offerings good. Is that not? I'm going to tell you it is. <laughs> that is precisely what Jesus does here. It's, it's the opposite of the cheese touch. It's the very opposite. Jesus takes water and connects it to his word. And this clean, holy water that's been sanctified by the word of God makes dirty, sinful, wicked people clean. The, the holy thing makes the unholy thing holy. And not just that, but the holy thing makes the dead thing alive. Babies come to this font dead in sin. And Jesus does a resurrection right here for all of us to see. And when you came to this font, you came to this font dead in sin. Dirty. And, and the power of Jesus touches you and makes you alive again. Makes you alive and new. And I know all of, many of you have been baptized before today. But the power of your baptism that made you once alive is still at work in your heart and life to make you new, to make you holy day after day after day. The holy thing of God, this, this sacrament of baptism, touches you and makes you alive and clean. And don't miss the same thing at the table. In our hands, we hold bread which has been consecrated. It's been set apart by the word of God. So, so that it's not just bread anymore when you eat it, but it's the body of, body of Jesus. 
And when you eat it, the purity and the holiness of Jesus touches your lips and you don't make him unclean, he makes you clean. So that when you eat his body, he makes you pure again. And when you drink that wine that's been set apart by the word of God, and that wine is Jesus' body, and when you drink it and it touches your lips, that wine makes you clean again. And so that just like the lepers who, who realized they were clean and went on their way rejoicing, you can go back from the Lord's Supper with a little bit of spring in your step. This is a pet peeve of mine, and I'm not suggesting that we do anything crazy, so please hear me out. I understand why when we come to the table, we are somber and quiet because we're repentant and sorrowful. We, we come to the table and we kneel because we're, we're laying our sins on the Lamb of God. But what always troubles me just a little bit, and I can't read hearts, but this is just my own thinking, and this is maybe just me being overly thoughtful, but I, you come back from the, the Lord's table and you're like, you walk back to your pew with your head down and you, don't, you avoid eye contact and then you sit down and you do this. Which is, I'm not suggesting you do anything irreverent or unholy or distracting to other people. But just think about it. In your hearts, has not God lit up your heart and made you alive again by his word and sacrament so that now the frown turns upside down and you have a smile? So that sin has been washed away and we go home rejoicing. I'm not suggesting a different practice. I'm not suggesting you go, that, you're, that you're coming home without thanks. But I'm reminding you that we come dirty, sinful, and unclean. And at this table, the Lord touches us with his body and blood and we go home clean and pure and holy and righteous. So how do we give an offering that pleases God? How, how do we give things that do things for our God that makes him smile? It's not something you and I can do. <laughs> but it is something that our Savior Jesus does. By word and sacrament, he makes you clean. By word and sacrament, he makes your services and your offerings clean. So that when you do them, the Father smiles and he says, thank you. Thank you for serving me with your very best and your very first. My son has made you clean. Amen? Amen. Now the God of peace grants you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen.